Good afternoon, everyone. It's 12 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, but welcome to our cardio webinar, the intersection of weight management and diabetes care. And my name is Sherry Bolin. I'm the co-PI of Cardio, and that is our statewide Ohio Cardiovascular and Diabetes Health Collaborative at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And the mission of Cardio, in case you're not as familiar with it as we are, was founded in 2017. Mission is really to improve cardiovascular and diabetes health outcomes and eliminate disparities in Ohio's Medicaid population. We link the Ohio seven medical schools and we have a group of healthcare professionals that join from those seven medical schools to identify, produce and disseminate evidence-based cardiovascular and diabetes best practices to primary care teams. And we encourage you to go to our website and see our different resources and learn more about cardio.org. We'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor, Ohio Department of Medicaid, and our administrative partner, Ohio College of Medicine Government Resource Center, as well as the seven schools of medicine who come together to collaborate to make cardio a success. And I would now for a little bit of logistics, I just wanted to um, remind people if you're joining as a group to please chat uh, the names and emails of all the people in your group into the chat. If you have questions, you can submit them at any point during the webinar using the Q&A feature, and we'll be answering those during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We do have a post-webinar evaluation survey that you'll see right afterward because we want your feedback on how to improve the webinar and also new topics that you might want to hear. We don't have any disclosures in either our speakers or our planning committee to mention this, this morning. And if you are interested in continuing medical education or CME and you have not registered, um, we have this QR code here that you can go to register so we can make sure we send you the appropriate CME survey so you can claim credit. And if you have any trouble with CME, just contact Kathy Sullivan who can help, um, help you with that. And you can see our agenda today. We'll really have um, Dr. O'Donnell talking about the intersection of weight management and diabetes care, and then the Q&A moderated by Dr. Zach. And I will just introduce uh, Dr. Zach, who is a family physician and vice chair of education at the Cleveland Clinic um, and faculty at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Zach serves as the head of education dissemination for cardio. Delighted to have her moderate today and let her introduce our keynote speaker. So thanks, Amy, I'll turn it to you. Thanks so much, Sherry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Benjamin O'Donnell is the Endocrinology Fellowship Program Director, as well as the Medical Director of Medical Weight Management at The Ohio University Wexner Medical Center. He attended medical school at University of Toledo and completed his internal medicine and fellowship training in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at Brown University. He started as faculty at The Ohio State University in July of 2013, with time split between general endocrinology and the comprehensive weight management clinic. So it's, again, my pleasure to have Dr. O'Donnell with us today. And with that, I think we can get started. Thanks, Dr. Zach and Dr. Bolin. Uh... As, as mentioned, uh, I do split my time uh, in between both the general endocrine world and then weight management, uh, which was really a focus that I wanted to, to have uh, from the get-go uh, when I started here at Ohio State. Um, so this topic uh, is, is actually just a perfect blend of, of my practice um, currently. So I'm thrilled to, to speak to such a, a diverse and, and large group. Um, and I know that this is a, a popular topic uh, as we were discussing this, this has been uh, something where I've had numerous requests uh, to talk on this topic recently. So um, something I feel passionate about, something I like to talk about. All right. So without further ado, uh, what we'll talk about today, um, I'll go into the epidemiology or background uh, information when it comes to obesity and how it relates uh, to diabetes. Uh, and then we'll get into a little bit more pathophysiology uh, in terms of using medications like the GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, for both uh, glucose control and uh, their positive impact on weight. Um, 
And then uh, we'll go into some details about lifestyle modifications and then other pharmacotherapy, uh, so other options to help patients achieve a healthy weight. I do want to start out with a little bit of a, a, a real world case. Uh, so this is a patient that I saw uh, earlier, so it was just about a year ago, actually, at this time. Um, gentleman who I had seen a number of years ago, 65 year old uh, male who is coming to the weight management clinic to seek options uh, for weight loss. Uh, at that point in time, there was uh, a different cadre of medicines that were available. Uh, so he was on Lorcaserin originally, uh, but had to stop the medicine in February of 2020 when it was withdrawn uh, from the market. Uh, he did not return after that visit, uh, at least for a couple of years uh, until February, uh, I'm sorry, April of 2022. So uh, that's when he came back to the clinic. And, and during the course of COVID, he had actually been able to maintain his weight loss. Um, so as you can see there, uh, starting in June of 2019, his initial weight was 443. And by February uh, of 2020, uh, his weight was down to 360. So a very uh, profound response uh, to both lifestyle changes and then medication. Um, comes back to the clinic in April 2022, his weight is at 353, translates to a BMI of 49 for that gentleman. So he actually had lost a little bit more weight. Uh, so his background medical history does have type 2 diabetes, um, coronary, I'm sorry, uh, cardiovascular disease, including atrial fibrillation, uh, and then a cardiomyopathy with preserved ejection fraction, and he does have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, he's a fairly limited in terms of uh, mobility. This is a gentleman who uses a motorized scooter uh, in, in all uh, situations, including in the home. Um, and then he did also have COVID over the summer or over the winter, uh, just prior to coming back to see me. Um, he did okay, though. He had a fairly moderate to severe course required oxygen uh, post-discharge from the hospital. So somewhat debilitated at the time that I was seeing him. Uh, medications at the time included metformin and liraglutide, and those were his, his medications for diabetes, and then you can see the others. Um, his A1C when he came in was six and a half, so uh, not uncontrolled diabetes, uh, but this was an interesting opportunity uh, because he was really coming back to talk about weight, not necessarily his blood sugar, but uh, in that regard, this is where we kind of had the blending of these two, uh, and it really led to uh, the next steps in therapy for him. So we'll come back to this case uh, after we go through a couple more things. So getting to that epidemiology uh, piece, uh, there are numerous different uh, maps that are available out there that describe uh, the prevalence of obesity, prevalence of diabetes across our country. Um, this I felt like was a great representation because instead of just giving us the big map with all the states and each state uh, generally um, is, it's kind of a snapshot. It doesn't really represent where all those populations of folks live though. So if we focus just briefly on this slide to look at Ohio in particular, because uh, we're all fairly uh, well-versed with the counties of Ohio, you can tell uh, what we're looking at here. Uh, so the, the lighter boxes, the white boxes are uh, the lowest prevalence of both diabetes and obesity. And then as you get into the redder shades, that's a higher prevalence of diabetes. Uh, and the bluer shades are a, a higher prevalence of obesity. So on the low end here, and this is 2004 data, um, prevalence of day, or I'm sorry, of obesity in most counties in Ohio, these are mostly the rural counties, was around 20%. Uh, and on the high end, the, the higher kind of darker blue, uh, the prevalence of obesity in those counties is uh, somewhere around 30%. So uh, at this snapshot where you can see are the population centers are really the ones that are carrying most of the burden when it comes to both obesity and diabetes. And that kind of holds true for most of these counties across the country. So this seems like a better snapshot, or at least they look at uh, which areas of the country are most affected by this. And then as we progress, so each five-year interval that we go by, uh, you can see, okay, now we're starting to see things fill in in terms of more prevalence of diabetes. Um, some of those counties that used to be white are now blue. And so the diabetes tends to follow those areas where the obesity tended to be higher initially, and this is the most recent data. So now we're getting uh, these very dark purple shaded counties, which is a combination of higher prevalence of obesity, higher prevalence of diabetes. Um, again, there are some areas where uh, the data may be missing, but uh, if you focus still on some of those um, population centers, so the, the more um, larger cities, uh, and then if you look in the Appalachian uh, area of Ohio uh, into West Virginia, uh, and again, the deep south, those tend to be the areas with the highest prevalence uh, of obesity and diabetes. 
So just some statistics as background. I know a lot of you out there probably treat a lot of patients with diabetes, so this is not new uh, information, but it's always good to review. So the prevalence of type two diabetes uh, as of the latest count by the CDC was about 11% of the adult population, uh, which translates to 37 million adults. That's a large burden of disease. Um, a, a very uh, profound number on top of that are the number of adults who have prediabetes. So these are all people who are at high risk of developing diabetes, uh, which is almost a third of the population. Uh, obesity itself is representing 42% roughly of adults in the United States. Um, and then, so some of the, the kind of long-term impacts of obesity and diabetes, of course, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in adults in, in the United States. And that is something that uh, is directly related to diabetes. Uh, diabetes itself is number seven on that list. Uh, I looked up this, this data again, so they've, they've updated this uh, somewhat recently. We used to only have data going back to 2008 to report uh, the cost of obesity, but what it's costing annually right now is estimated $170 billion, which is equivalent to how much uh, the cost of uh, damages from Hurricane Katrina uh, was back in 2005. Uh, so I, as something to try to relate, uh, obesity itself, and this is just the cost of obesity, imparting basically the same level of damage on the country annually uh, as something like Hurricane Katrina, which is a very traumatic thing uh, when it did occur. So to talk a little bit about the, the social determinants of health, and, and this gets to likely some of those impacts of why certain counties have a higher prevalence of obesity, uh, certain uh, counties have a higher prevalence of, of diabetes uh, because it's this intersection of, of a person's health status with their, um, again, social determinants uh, and how that impacts their health. So uh, this data comes from uh, the National Health Interview Survey. This is uh, something that is um, done annually uh, through the National Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the CDC. Um, it's a 38 question questionnaire that's sent out to families. Um, generally in one household, they'll have an adult and a child uh, represented if that is represented in that household. So uh, they go through all these, these different questionnaires uh, and really what they're looking at are uh, questions about economic stability, their neighborhood, so their physical environment, um, the social cohesion of the environment, community aspects, uh, food insecurity, education, and then healthcare. So, and the healthcare questions kind of range from do they have access to healthcare to their insurance status uh, and cost of those things. So what's represented here on the, the top half of uh, the graph, the orange and blue lines are the lower weight category. So normal weight in blue uh, and then overweight, which is a BMI between 25 and 30 in the orange. Uh, and they broke all these, these uh, the answers to this questionnaire into deciles. So each uh, decile represents starting on the, the left side from first to 10th a lower impact from those social determinants. So uh, let's call it a more favorable uh, social determinant of health versus on the 10th or the far right side is kind of a less favorable social determinants of health. Um, and those are all, th those are explaining the questionnaire of, of what makes it favorable versus unfavorable. But in general, looking at that, people who have a greater impact of more unfavorable social determinants, uh, as you can see, the, the lines for obesity uh, both class one, class two, and class three, they all increase over those deciles. Interestingly, there is a drop between first and second, and some of that can be uh, kind of an economic uh, status type thing, let's say. Um, but the same thing uh, with normal weight and overweight, they tend to trend down um, as you're getting into those uh, less favorable. So less people who have a normal or uh, slightly overweight uh, in a higher proportion uh, those with a more unfavorable social determinants uh, in the obesity category. So all this is to kind of say, when you're seeing patients in your clinic and, and everybody has this experience, there are gonna be uh, specific health uh, aspects to that person, their family history, uh, medications they might be on, but then you have to also take into account their social determinants and how those are gonna impact, uh, again, choices of medicines, potentially their access to medicines, things like that. All right, so to spend a little bit of time on this, I know this is a, a busy slide. I think a lot of people are familiar with this. Also, this is uh, the uh, American Diabetes Association uh, standards of care, so treatment for uh, people with type two diabetes. And this slide in particular is focusing on uh, glucose lowering medications. Although I do like to point out uh, this very top line here, which is 
really the, the kind of basis for treatment for anyone, uh, is counseling on healthy lifestyle behaviors. <clears throat> and then also referrals to diabetes self-management education and support. And then also, again, taking into account their social determinants of health. <clears throat> so that's gonna, be, that's gonna be the baseline for everyone. And then the next steps are going to be looking at uh, really their risk factors uh, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, uh, including established disease, if they have high risk indicators or if they have um, heart failure, and that can be either reduced or preserved ejection fraction um, or CKD. So we'll go into this on the next slide, but then interestingly on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, the ADA has now added this in, and this is really the last couple of years, but they're, they're highlighting the need to both impact a person's glucose control and weight uh, to help impact a, a more durable blood sugar lowering uh, strategy. Um, and so this comes from, we have a lot of uh, uh, medications available these days that will do both and they do both very well. Uh, and that's kind of what they're highlighting here. So uh, if somebody has, um, or if the need, or, or I guess the, the aim is to lower glucose most effectively, uh, again, it's gonna be a similar theme here, but the GLP ones tend to rise to the top of, of the treatment algorithm there. Um, Specifically, if, if the goal is really to look at how do we maximize this person's weight loss, um, in addition to this top box, which is focused on lifestyle changes, uh, uh, engaging in a multidisciplinary approach, so uh, uh, like a diabetes prevention type model, although that wouldn't be <laughs> specific to somebody who has diabetes, but a, a uh, comprehensive or an intensive uh, lifestyle program, let's say, um, but also could include other medications for weight loss or uh, metabolic or bariatric surgery is an option. Um, but when you're talking about medications, again, the GLP-1 type medicines are gonna rise to this uh, top of the algorithm here. And we'll talk about this uh, more specifically in the next couple of slides. So again, getting back to those first couple of branch points, what we look at are, if you have your, your choice of medications with your patient, which you wanna look for first, are they the highest risk for atherosclerotic disease? Do they have heart failure, do they have chronic kidney disease? And so uh, in each of these, uh, so more in the cardiovascular realm of uh, either established disease or high risk disease, the GLP ones are gonna be uh, the preferred first uh, option or an SGLT2 that has uh, proven cardiovascular benefit. And if there's still not a goal after instituting one of those, you actually just kind of flip flop and, and then go with the next one. Um, now in patients who have specific uh, heart failure, uh, an SGLT2 is going to have uh, more beneficial impacts for them earlier. Um, on that last slide, there are arrows that kind of go in each direction off of these. So you, this doesn't mean that you stop at the SGLT2, but this would be the first place to start. And similarly with CKD, uh, they're going to benefit more from an SGLT2. Um, or if for some reason they have uh, a GFR that's lower than the threshold for starting, um, or if they have a contraindication to an SGLT2, then you wanna start a GLP-1 that has um, some proven cardiovascular benefit. And again, if they're not a target on that first initial uh, medication, then you can move on uh, again to the kind of uh, other option that's listed here. Uh, All right, so uh, just thinking about the, uh, the mechanisms of both of these medications. So the GLP-1 receptor agonists, these are very well studied. And we, I have another slide that I'll get into kind of all of the things that they do, but how these help out both with weight and then glucose lowering. So the GLP-1s are known to enhance uh, glucose-dependent insulin secretion. Um, they also have an effect on delaying gastric emptying. Um, they have an interesting impact on reducing intestinal chylomicron production and secretion. So they've actually been shown to reduce triglycerides in circulation. Um, and then they can also work centrally in the hypothalamus to reduce appetite. So all of these things put together help lower blood sugar, but also help with reducing appetite and weight. Uh, the SGLT2s are a little bit different in terms of how they impact weight. Um, their primary mechanism is uh, in the kidney. So they're gonna block the sodium glucose co-transporter, which is reabsorbing glucose that has already been filtered out. Uh, when the, that, that reabsorption is blocked, um, they will lose glucose in the urine, so it increases glucosuria. Um, interestingly, this has a reduction, or I'm sorry, an effect in reducing circulating insulin because circulating sugar is, uh, or glucose is lower. Um, the, the glucosuria can lead to some amount of diuretic effect at a lower blood pressure, 
um, and it has this uh, positive impact on the kidneys by reducing um, the pressure within the glomerulus itself. So when you look at each of these different impacts, and this is another one of these slides, there's a lot going on here, but again, kind of looking at each of these medicines, we've got in the purple boxes, the impacts from the GLP-1 receptors, and in the green boxes, the SGLT2 inhibitors. And because they do things slightly differently, uh, they have this really nice uh, complementary effect when you add them together um, to have beneficial impacts on blood sugar, cardioprotection, and nephroprotection. Um, each, so the GLP-1s, uh, through their impacts on, um, on decreasing sympathetic tone, improving vasodilation, improving endothelial function, these all have beneficial impacts on cardiovascular disease. Um, the SGLT2s, through that um, kind of diuretic effect, uh, decrease in cardiac preload, um, overall plasma volume, and, and having an impact on natriuresis, that's been shown also to help with cardioprotection. So uh, again, both of these medicines have benefits beyond um, just glucose lowering. So um, uh, again, this is where they've kind of risen to the top of this algorithm um, to become the first choice uh, in medications. Interestingly, they don't cause any hypoglycemia on their own. If, if the patient is already on insulin, uh, or sulfonylurea, they may have some hypoglycemia when instituting the medicine. So you do have to be careful with that. All right, so I do wanna spend a little bit of time just going over the, um, the weight loss that can be expected. And so this, is, this data was not from trials uh, where they were looking for weight loss specifically. These were phase three, trials for each of these different GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, and I'm, I've, I've kind of compiled their average weight loss from each of these studies. These are all at differing doses. So these are kind of efficacy uh, and tolerability studies and then different uh, amounts of time spent. But if we look at just the earlier medications, so we have exenatide uh, weekly and liraglutide as a daily dose. Uh, what you're looking at is about a two to three, maybe three and a half kilogram weight loss in these variable amounts of time in these folks. Um, somewhere to two to three kilograms with exenatide. Similarly, dulaglutide, which is uh, kind of a later generation weekly uh, GLP-1, similar amounts of weight loss there. So if you're looking at just uh, glucose control and instituting these medicines, this is about what you should expect or can expect from um, starting one of these medicines. So starting with the semaglutide, as a weekly preparation, there's a little bit more weight loss to be achieved here. So you're looking at five to maybe six and a half kilograms of weight loss uh, for these folks. Um, so maglutide comes as an oral um, as well. And that did show roughly about four kilograms of weight loss in their study. Uh, talked about the cardiovascular outcomes with all of these. And I do think it's, it's good to highlight there is slight differences between each of these. And some of that comes from the different types of GLP-1, but also, uh, the way that these trials were set up. But uh, the thing to, to keep in mind, uh, what we're looking at for uh, the leader trial, sustain six and rewind, uh, the primary outcome, so reduction in, in uh, MACE was met and it was superior in each of those trials. Um, with Excel, which is exenatide, there was a reduction in all cause death. Um, and interestingly, the other two weekly preparations, so semaglutide, dulaglutide, most of this reduction in the primary outcome came from a reduction in stroke. Whereas with the daily liraglutide, uh, there was reduction in MI, cardiovascular death and all cause death. So um, I think it's safe to say this is a, a, a class effect when you're talking about reduction in cardiovascular, um, but it's slightly different uh, depending on which agent you're, you're choosing. Uh, now to compare that, sorry. Comparing uh, a little bit of the uh, weight loss and, and cardiovascular outcomes specifically uh, with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so there's two studies. There was really Canvas and then Credence, which was Credence kind of a combination renal progression study plus cardiovascular um, outcome study. It included a, a weight loss, um, at least reported weight loss. Some of the other renal studies for the SGLT2s, they didn't report um, the weight loss component of it. So uh, I really only included the cardiovascular studies here, but really uh, what's important, so three of these, so Canvas, uh, Declare, Timmy, and then Empereg, uh, 
uh, showed superior outcomes when it came to their, uh, their reduction in uh, the three-point mace. Um, for Virtus, which is ertugliflozin, uh, it was not superior, so it was a non-inferior study. Um, but to compare the, the weight loss across this group of medicines, uh, you're really looking at about a one to two kilogram weight loss in general. These are cardiovascular outcome studies. So again, not set up as a weight loss study, uh, but a longer period of follow-up, um, somewhere in the two and a half to four years follow-up for each of these. So um, I think for anybody who's used these medicines, I think it's fairly common to see some weight loss when they're initiating it. And this again, somewhat a component of um, just the glucosuria, um, the diuretic effect, but there is, there is real weight loss that's maintained for a lot of patients um, as long as they're on these medicines. So to compare the two groups, if we're looking at which ones are having a greater impact, clearly the, or I'm sorry, the GLP-1 receptor agonists have greater potential for weight loss uh, in patients with diabetes, um, though the SGLT2s also promote that. And then there is some combined uh, benefit if you add them together. All right, so if we think back to that, the big busy study or uh, algorithm at the very beginning of this where weight management uh, has become kind of an, uh, an important component uh, in diabetes management. Uh, we're going to shift a little bit to just focus on the weight management side of it. So again, this is that, that focus from the ADA standards of care. Um, so high efficacy uh, treatments, so both glucose lowering and then the weight management to provide, again, a more durable uh, glucose lowering effect. So uh, talking with patients about weight loss uh, can get a little bit complex. Um, so there are, I'm going to give you some uh, kind of easy to digest things and things to give your patients uh, as kind of uh, ways to do this uh, in a stepwise fashion, because really it does make more sense. It, it impacts patients better if they, they set small goals and if they're able to achieve those small goals over time, um, rather than sending them out the door uh, with too many things to, to kind of digest and, and work on over time. But for the for the providers out there, so to, to think about um, what exactly, what does it mean to, uh, to lose weight? So this is, it's a fairly simple formula, uh, but to talk about it in, in these details, I think helps. So our total energy expenditure, this is how much energy uh, each person is using on a daily basis, comes from both resting metabolic rate, uh, the thermic effect of feeding, meaning it takes calories to actually break down food, and then the activity component of that daily activity. Um, in, in general, the resting metabolic rate makes up the vast majority of this, so about three quarters of that total energy expenditure. Within that daily activity, and, and that includes sedentary activity, uh, it can include something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or basically just fidgeting. So folks who are a little bit more prone to movement when they're sitting still, uh, they may expend a little bit more calories that way. Um, and then these two, these two tiles off to the left-hand side. So what we're showing here, um, the top uh, panel is really a study looking at how do rats respond to either um, overfeeding or underfeeding. So if they're starting at a, a baseline weight, you underfeed them, they'll lose weight. But the body's compensatory mechanisms, which is really to drive up appetite, will lead that, that particular rat to regain weight. Um, a similar effect happens if they are just given too many calories, they're overfed. Um, and they do get signals to reduce food intake. And so they'll return to their, uh, their baseline in general. This is a snapshot in time. And so um, this longer period of time, so if we're looking at over years, uh, a person starting at a certain weight, whether they're on the lean trajectory here or they're on a uh, kind of overweight to obese trajectory, um, the body has a very good sense of where the weight is at. So whether it's up here or it's down here, if there's a calorie reduction for a period of time, they're going to see weight loss, but then the body just has that same response, whether it's in the lean uh, individual or an obese individual uh, to want to regain that weight. So this is kind of the set point or somebody returning to their set point after following uh, a particular diet for uh, some amount of time. So I've talked with patients for quite a while now talking about, well, what's the formula for weight loss? And I actually found this book um, <laughs> to spell it out a heck of a lot easier. Uh, than trying to go through all this uh, kind of excess detail. Uh, so Tommy Tomlinson, is a, he's an author. He actually used to work for numerous news outlets and he was a sports writer. Um, and at one point decided he wanted to lose weight. And so this was his formula. It was number one, find a way to measure the calories you eat and drink. And number two, find a way to measure the calories that you burn 
And number three, make sure that every day, number one is smaller than number two. Um, you can't get any simpler than this. And luckily there's a lot of apps and things that allow patients to do this for themselves. Um, I've got another slide and activity, so I'm gonna skip over this briefly. Um, to speak about nutrition, so nutrition is a complex thing again. So all humans are interesting. They like to eat what they like. Um, and this has been studied over a number of different uh, dietary changes that no one specific diet uh, has been found to be more effective than others. Um, you'll hear patients ask about the ketogenic diet. Um, everybody knows about Atkins and South Beach, and there's a variety of other um, diet changes out there, including intermittent fasting and whatnot. Um, you really have to talk to patients about what they like to eat and work within their own preferences. Now, at the same time, you do want to maintain appropriate um, nutrients. So if somebody is really just eating fast food and what we're trying to say is, well, eat less of it, that's not really a healthy diet. Um, so there are healthier ways to, to incorporate, um, you know, fruits and vegetables and more fiber and protein in their diet. Um, the goal though, in the, the long run, so uh, to achieve weight loss, the, the person needs to be in this negative calorie balance. And so what we usually say is about a 500 calorie deficit per day, each day of the week will lead to one pound of weight loss per week. So if we think about one calorie, I'm sorry, one pound is equivalent to about 3,500 uh, kilocalories. And so any multiple of that, uh, as long as a person is kind of accurately keeping track of calories, they should achieve a steady weight loss. Um, sticking with one to two pounds of weight loss per week is, is generally the most effective. It's gonna be at a rate that they can sustain. Um, anything above two pounds, they're, they're gonna, potentially run into these uh, kind of counter-regulatory measures by the body to slow metabolism. Um, and then the body actually will start breaking down other, other things beyond um, kind of stored fat and glycogen. You can start breaking down muscle, um, which then has a, a detrimental effect on, on um, metabolism long-term. So that's where this dietary uh, intake, it should not be lower than 800 kilocalories. That's just too low. Uh, and then, and again, the body will start breaking down um, protein sources, so muscle uh, for energy. Um, I know I have on the first line here, so men in general, a low calorie diet would uh, be somewhere in the 1500 to 1800 range and women 12 to 1500, but that's, that's very general. So really speaking to people about this 500 calorie deficit. Um, again, my patient that I mentioned at the beginning of this, his resting metabolic rate is probably closer to the 3000 kilocalories per day. Um, and a 1500 calorie reduction for him uh, is going to be excessive. Uh, it's going to be hard for him to stick with that. So over the long term, we want to start out again, uh, probably a, a good goal to shoot for at first is 5% weight loss, but 10% is really meant to be um, a more impactful weight loss for that person, um, helping to improve things like mobility, reduce blood pressure, um, glucose, cholesterol, uh, all these things. And again, so activity is an important component of this and, and an important thing to remember. So patients, uh, when they're engaging in activity, um, it doesn't have to be at a gym. It doesn't have to be a, you know, the traditional things that uh, patients, I think, think of when they're told, okay, you've got to exercise. There are plenty of things that they can do, uh, including uh, things accessible in the neighborhood or at, at home. Um, walking is a really good thing to recommend or at least counsel patients on to start with. So. Um, either one of these paces, 15 to 20 minutes per mile is going to put them in a moderate, uh, intensity activity. And really, if they can do that for about 30 to 35 minutes, most days of the week, they're going to hit the goal, which is about 150 minutes of that moderate intensity activity each week. I like this slide because I think things like table tennis, which can be much more fun, um, or the things like raking leaves, lawn mowing, these are things that we can do seasonally, but they're available, um, to most people. Now that's, that's thinking, okay, oh, those are people who have a yard or they have, you know, things to take care of. So again, not generalizable to everybody, but, uh, things that they can be aware of. Um, the other important thing about exercise to know, so what, what this is representing here, this is 150 kilocalories. So the 150 calories expended for this amount of activity in a 154 pound adult. Um, patients who are, uh, say, overweight, class one to class three obesity, there's going to be more weight that they actually physically have to move while exercising. So they actually uh, will expend more calories than this. So their amount of time spent on this initially is not going to have to total up to this amount of time. Um, it may be 15 to 20 minutes. And some of this is just also getting people more active than they are at baseline. 
Um, so you want to take people if they're they're in a sedentary role at work, they don't engage in a lot of activity, and just start with small goals to say, you know what, five to ten minutes, three to four days out of the week, let's start with that, and then go up from there. Any kind of activity is going to be better than a sedentary lifestyle. So we'll go through some of these medicines. I'll go through this somewhat quickly because some of this is just historical, but. Um, weight loss medications, I think they carry a little bit of a, um, uh, I don't know, a spotty history. Um, and to say this in a way, the medicines have a role. Their role is to help manage appetite, um, but they really are only going to work as long as the person is taking the medicine. So the longer they can stay on a medicine safely, the better they're going to respond. So that gets to some of the background here. So our, our medicines that were available um, really through most of the last century uh, we're really just sympathetic nervous system agonists or these serotonin agents. So phentermine, we still use quite a bit, um, but most of the rest of these medicines are not really used much anymore. And some of that has to do with the serotonin agents, um, which does include cybutramine, did have some uh, negative cardiovascular effects. Um, so the valvulopathy is with fenfen, which I think a lot of people are aware of, and then cybutramine, which was uh, during a cardiovascular study found to in increase the risk of cardiovascular disease was then taken off the market. So around 1999, this is when Orlistat was, was brought to the market. Um, nothing else was available at the time. Fentramine was actually off the market then because it was combined with fenfen. Um, Orlistat is a pancreatic lipase inhibitor. I think most of us are aware of the side effects that come from that medicine. Um, it doesn't lead to a whole lot of weight loss. And so again, tolerability and then the, the kind of um, uh, weight loss that people do achieve with it <clears throat> is underwhelming. So not a lot of people stick with that one. Um, I include this medicine, Rimonaban, although this was not available in the United States, um, just a different type uh, of use um, of a medicine. And then uh, medicines that were developed kind of in the early 2010s uh, included uh, fentramine to a combination of older medicines, lorcasrin, which I had mentioned earlier, uh, naltrexone, bupropion, and then liraglutide, which had been around for diabetes, uh, kind of refashioned for weight loss. Now, rimonaban has been removed from the market. Lorcasrin was removed in 2020 uh, because of this increased risk of cancers. Uh, and that was actually in their cardiovascular study. So Again, I, I kind of mentioned this as we've got medicines that are very good for diabetes in terms of glucose lowering, they have the effect on weight that we are looking for with reassuring data in terms of cardiovascular disease. So this is kind of the new world of, of what we have available uh, to help with weight loss. So this slide is really just kind of historical, again, uh, for reference, uh, if people want to come back to this at some point, but uh, I do want to point out, so we do have of the, the medicines that are approved for chronic use currently, which include fentramine, plus topiramate, bupropion, and naltrexone, and liraglutide. Um, the amount of weight loss seen in these is okay. So you're looking at about 19 pounds uh, in the fentramine topiramate group, and that is on the highest dose at one year, uh, versus 12 to 13 pounds in these other two. Um, for, for use, um, I guess real-world use, fentramine, topiramate, bupropion, naltrexone are reasonably priced, although this, this can kind of price out a lot of people, uh, whereas liraglutide, if it's not covered by insurance, tends to be um, overwhelmingly expensive. Let's just go there. Um, so realistically, they're available, they do help, uh, they're pretty well tolerated, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of times insurance doesn't cover them. And so um, this is where we kind of slink back to, well, fentramine is available and it's, it's affordable. Um, but it's not used long-term. It's a, it's a short-term intermittent use medicine. So the data um, doesn't include long-term outcomes. And again, we all know short-term impacts on weight, they don't last. So, so the newest kit on the block for, for medicines for weight loss is semaglutide at a 2.4 milligram dose. This was approved just about two years ago. It's about a year and a half at this point. Um, this is data from their initial study. Um, I didn't show the initial study data from some of the other medicines, but um, the thing that was profound here, so the average weight loss, this is mean weight loss uh, for all participants was about 12 and a half percent and 12.7 kilograms, about 28 pounds uh, average weight loss. So if we compare that with the 19 and below pounds that were on the other studies, um, you can see a, kind of a step up in terms of uh, success of weight loss uh, for these folks. The other important thing here, um, which in some of the earlier studies, they didn't even report out to how many 
patients were able to achieve this 15% weight loss. 50% of the participants in this study achieved 15% weight loss and, and not an insignificant, one third of them were able to achieve 20% weight loss. So you're really looking at um, impactful, meaningful weight loss for these patients. Again, this is medicine. So while they're on the medicine, they're seeing this, this benefit. Um, and I know the question always comes up, well, what do we do when we have to stop the medicine? So we'll get there. Uh, so here's, here's this patient again. So uh, the person I had mentioned earlier, again, 65 year old gentleman, type two diabetes, he's got sleep apnea, um, previously on lorcasserin. So currently on metformin and loraglutide. So when I met with him, we talked about, okay, he's tolerating loraglutide well, but can we get a little bit more robust appetite uh, and weight impact if we switch uh, over to a weekly GLP-1? Um, he said, hey, that's less shots also, so let's go for it. So we switched from uh, loraglutide at 1.8 over to semaglutide one milligram. And it was okay. He didn't see a whole lot of difference, but that was about the same time semaglutide uh, was approved for a two milligram dose. So at the next month, we had him come back and, and we bumped up the dose of semaglutide. He could tell a difference then. He had a, a more beneficial impact on his appetite, didn't have as many cravings. Uh, he could control snacking a little bit better. Um, and so that was in May of 2022. And by August, um, so I guess it would be October technically, <laughs> he was down uh, another 30 pounds. So his, his weight loss. And again, he was being, um, on his side of it, when it comes to the lifestyle measures, he was, he was jotting things down, keeping track of calories. Uh, but again, he was not very mobile. So this was a guy who we had a conversation about an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, but in his, his instance, because he wasn't able to get to the bathroom, uh, as quickly as he would like, he opted not to start on one of those, but that would be a very reasonable choice in this gentleman, especially with his history. Um, of that cardiomyopathy, if you take out the, the impact of his mobility. Um, this is just some data looking at that, that difference between the one and two milligram dose of semaglutide. So on the left-hand side here, we have uh, the difference in A1C, um, and this was in a 40-week uh, study uh, in these patients, and then the difference in weight. So about a one kilogram difference and about a 0.3% uh, additional benefit when it comes to A1C. So uh, again, in clinical study, not a profound difference. Again, this is diabetes, not set up specifically for weight loss, but there is some additive benefit uh, when it comes to weight. And then the other option that I had mentioned to him is the other medicine that is kind of getting all the, the headlines lately, which is terzepatide. Um, so currently just approved for type 2 diabetes. Um, this is the GLP-1 GIP receptor agonist. Um, this is data from their, their phase 3 study looking at different um, doses, uh, and as it relates to diabetes. So what we're looking at on the left-hand side here are the A1C reductions, which are, are very good at uh, roughly 1.9 to a little bit over 2% uh, reduction in, in A1C. And then on the right-hand side here, this was the impact on weight. And so the, the different um, bars here represent those different doses, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams. Um, and this was compared to placebo. Uh, and so what you're looking at here, and this is again, uh, a shorter study. So 40 weeks, this is not a weight management study, but uh, very robust weight loss here at nine and a half uh, kilograms. Now, terzepatide does have weight loss data. So their study called surmount uh, one, uh, they looked at those same doses. So five, 10 and 15 milligram doses. And this was titrated slowly uh, to help with tolerance of the medicine. And then the, par the uh, participants were on the medicines for a year. Um, they were counseled on a 500 calorie deficit and that same exercise goal of 150 minutes per week. And as you can see, again, you see a stepwise increase when it comes to dose and weight, um, at least reduction in weight. Now, again, you could argue 10 to 15 milligrams. There's not a huge change here, but there is some increase in weight loss. Uh, and then what you're looking at on the right-hand side are those proportions, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25% weight loss. Um, and this was a study, again, it got a lot of headlines because you're looking at 50% of participants, so half of the participants in this study at the 10 milligram dose, as well as the 15, were able to achieve 20% weight loss. And this is, this is, I mean, frankly, in a, a weight management world, this is very impressive. Um, this medicine, this is a study to look for, for weight management. This medicine has not been approved yet. Um, currently ongoing, they have a two-year study, so kind of the one-year follow-up after this, um, which has been kind of the course before these medicines get approved. So likely coming down the pike. 
Um, how do these two compare? Now, this is a, uh, a diabetes population, semaglutide versus terzepatide. Um, and this is the one milligram dose uh, in this kind of grayish bar here of semaglutide versus that 5, 10, 15 of terzepatide. Um, and you, you can see the, the A1C change, uh, terzepatide, is slightly better in each of those. And then the weight loss, similarly, um, you see a little bit better weight loss, um, terzepatide versus semaglutide. Again, it's not comparing the weight management version, the 2.4 milligram dose. It's not the two milligram dose either, which is also available. So um, not exactly apples to apples comparison here. All right, so uh, somehow I'm right on time here, but I do wanna wrap up uh, quickly with these, uh, just kind of my closing thoughts. And I do have a, a slide that includes some resources available to, again, um, provide some data for patients or at least some, um, some counseling for patients, but uh, lifestyle modification. And this is that, uh, you know, making sure that they're, they're following a, a calorie restricted or a, a, a consistent calorie diet uh, with, edu or, I'm sorry, with either education, uh, the diabetes education uh, component, dietary counseling, um, and then activity uh, goals is really the foundation of diabetes management as well as, as weight loss. Um, We've got a lot of uh, kind of newer options out there when it comes to diabetes management that are very good uh, in terms of weight loss as well. Uh, and that can be complemented uh, when it comes to adding the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and again, in some aspects like my patient that I talked about, it's not necessarily a, uh, an A1C target because his A1C was at goal, but we're really looking for that, um, you know, the high efficacy, long-term impact on, on glucose. So weight loss as a, an important component to that. Um, and again, the GLP-1s, SGLT-2s have been found uh, to have beneficial cardiovascular outcome effects. Um, and then uh, you know, time will tell with the GLP-1, GIP. Uh, we'll see how that uh, does as well. Um, all right, I will wrap up right there though. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Donnell. Um, I wanted to remind everybody, if you do have questions, if you would please put them in the question and answer tool um, uh, on Zoom, and we will keep an eye on the chat as well for those that have already been put in there. Um, we do have a number of questions. The first I think is maybe the biggest one on everybody's mind, which is how do we achieve payment for these GLP-1 medications for our patients if they don't have a diagnosis of diabetes? And in many cases, even if they do. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think when it comes to insurance, uh, we are, we're kind of all constrained by what the formulary is. Um, in a positive way, for most of the patients we're talking about here, including the patient that I have mentioned, uh, when it comes to diabetes, getting coverage for a GLP-1 receptor agonist is, is really not difficult. Um, most plans are gonna cover one. Uh, they may cover multiple. Um, so it's really finding the right one on their formulary. Um, I didn't present a whole lot of data for some of the other ones outside of the kind of batched uh, weight loss targets, but. Um, the fact that semaglutide, terzepatide on the guidelines have kind of risen to the top, um, I think that does help inform formularies. So I do find, uh, and this, I think there's plenty of people out there who would uh, notice the same thing, that semaglutide tends to be covered. Um, if they don't have diabetes, um, it, that's just a trickier thing. Then it is really dependent on if their, their insurance will cover weight management um, medications or therapies. Um, in some of those situations, and typically um, the ones that are covered um, are fentermine, <laughs> generally a cost thing, or the GLP-1s. Uh, but if they happen to be somewhere in between where they have coverage for one of the oral medications, but they have contraindications, uh, it may require um, writing an appeal or something like that. But um, yeah, I wish I, had, I wish I had a great, okay, here's the trick to getting these things covered, and there, there just isn't one. Um, in that same vein, um, I think, um, many of us are often asked to send GLP one prescriptions to different places. So, uh, somebody asked about compounding pharmacy, maybe it's, um, printing it out for use with an online pharmacy or Canadian pharmacy. I mean, all of these different things that are out there. Um, do you have any recommendations or thoughts on, on these 
uh, areas of questions as well. So realistically, yes. I mean, the, the Canadian options are out there um, and they are cheaper. So if that will require the patient though to have the, you know, the means to access it, and it's not that it's really cheap. So for example, something like um, semaglutide in, in the diabetes doses, um, it's probably about $200 uh, for a prescription. And then it just kind of depends on who that person is, if that's a reasonable amount for them. Um, I have not sent a prescription to a compounding pharmacy, so I can't speak to that. But um, if the person has access, um, and really they have to know about it, because I don't... <laughs> I don't know of a Canadian pharmacy, but they'll come in and, and I've had that experience where, yes, can you print it out and, and they can obtain it that way. Um, it is an option. Uh, and I guess a, another question is in thinking about uh, non-GLP-1 uh, medications, um, do you ever prescribe bupropion and naltrexone independently for cost, kind of cost benefit? Um, because it's cheaper than the combined medication. Yeah, I would, so probably the, the combination that is tolerated a little bit better is the fentramine and topiramate. And that one is um, because there's, a, there's an extended release form of topiramate also, it's a little bit easier to do that one as, as smaller amounts of pills. Bupropion and naltrexone, because it's a, the dose for the bupropion half is 360 milligrams and the uh, naltrexone half um, is 32 milligrams. It's, they're kind of weird multiples and it's typically taken twice a day. So it's kind of a heavy pill burden uh, for patients. So um, there may be compounding pharmacies out there. Again, I can't speak to that. I haven't sent a prescription or, or tried to do that. Um, that could take those components and, and do it in a slightly cheaper fashion, although I'm not sure. I'm not sure that would end up being a lot cheaper um, but fentramine is, is generally much more affordable and topiramate, you can, you can get that covered by most insurance plans as kind of an off-label use. Um, so that one tends to be a little bit easier to do. Um, there is a little bit of a difference though, because I have done that for some patients, um, but I feel like they, they respond better when it is the, the combined, um, the form that, and the way that you can get it slightly cheaper there, there are, um, online programs for that fentramine and topiramate um, through the, the manufacturer. It's not ex exactly cheap. It's about $100 a month, but it is cheaper than um, what the pharmacies will, will charge. So we have a lot of questions here. So I want to say we'll try and get through everything we can. For those folks who have asked for us to go back to different slides, all the slides will be available. So you will be able to have access to those and the resource slides as well. Um, so what percentage of patients on GLP-1 meds have no weight loss effect? Um, and um, is there any way to know which patients are going to respond better than others? That's a good question. I, you know, I have had a handful of patients where I'm, I'm kind of shocked when they come back, um, having not noticed any difference. They don't have any side effects. Um, and I can't tell you from, you know, let's say, a clinical trial or anecdotally what is different about each of those folks. Um, I would tell you the vast majority though, starting on semaglutide and, and titrating up, um, they respond. Um, now, again, like I said, I, I can think of two people uh, <laughs> who didn't uh, or they did initially and then they stopped responding somewhat quickly, which there is a little bit of an uh, adaption or uh, adaptation. So the body initially going from so not taking anything to then starting one of the GLP ones, I feel like that's when they get kind of more side effects. They have a little bit more of an impact from the medicine, uh, but side effects and tolerance are, are, you know, they get better with time. Um, but generally around six months, I hear from a lot of patients that they, they will tell that their appetite is a little bit more noticeable, or they feel like the medicine's not working as well. Um, in that situation, usually it's more of their, they're adapting to being on the medicine rather than the medicine not working. Um, but I, I can think of uh, you know, one person in particular, she didn't, didn't have much of a response until she was on the highest dose and then, then it started to work. So um, I don't have a great predictor uh, tool to, to help aid with that, but it, it's gonna, in the vast majority of people, they'll work well. 
Can you speak to uh, knowing when to stop the medication? Um, if the patient is down below indicated BMI um, or at goal, and then also what to do about rebound weight gain um, and how to handle that. Yeah, so those are that's a, a really good question. Um, most of the time when I'm talking to patients and, and they may come in with a weight loss goal or a goal that they want to be at, um, and many of them are aware of, you know, the normal BMI range. And they, if that's in their, their, um, their mind as a goal to achieve, uh, we, we tend to kind of talk through that. And so setting a different type of goal rather than saying, okay, you need to be at a certain weight or your BMI needs to be X for you to be quote unquote healthy. Cause they may, they may just want to have better range of motion. Um, they want to complete a half marathon, you know, they have some other outcome that they want to do. Um, so it's, it does come down to an individual thing. So the, the medicines for weight management, um, the ones that are approved for chronic use, you can keep people on them once they have actually achieved a normal weight, cause you can, you can, uh, continue them for a weight maintenance effect. Um, so it's not necessary to stop them. Although economically, it's hard to tell people you're going to take this medicine that's costing you know, X number of dollars for the rest of your life. Um, so I would say if somebody has, uh, achieved the goal that they're looking for and whether that's okay, my BMI is below 25 or whatever it is, they feel, they feel okay with where they're at. Um, the thing to really make, uh, uh an important point about is that exercise component. So they're going to need to exercise in general, uh, about 200 minutes per week to maintain their weight loss. And so that's going to really help now that they are a lower weight, um, if they return close to where their, their eating habits had been previously, because that will be far and above their, their current caloric need, the, the increase in exercise can help to moderate that. It's not a perfect fix, uh, but generally after people have lost a certain amount of weight um, and ideally doing some exercise with that, uh, being able to perform more exercise is easier. Um, so again, it's it, it, focusing on those healthy lifestyle changes as they're stopping the medicine or titrating down and coming off of it. Um, I think with the GLP ones, the other tricky thing is it takes a long time to titrate them up. And so I don't have a lot of patients who I've taken off. Um, I can think of a couple. Uh, so I don't have, again, a whole lot of uh, useful uh, patient experiences there. Okay, this worked well to keep the, the weight off of it. Uh, so we... Um... We're going to have time for one more question. Um, I know there's a couple of questions that uh, remain unanswered. We will ask Dr. O'Donnell to take a look at those and um, we'll provide some answers available with the slides. Um, but just to end, um, there's a couple of questions about um, whether you would give a trial of GLP-1s to folks who have a history of pancreatitis. Um, and if you would not, would you trial SGL SGLT2s instead? I would be very cautious if they have a history of pancreatitis. Um, although I can tell you, so it, like, for example, if they know the cause of the pancreatitis, if it's a gallstone uh, pancreatitis, they had their gallbladder removed. Um, I think in that instance, you could be you know, cautious and start it and just inform them about the potential symptoms. And the, of course, they'll be aware of it. Um, if it's somebody who's had pancreatitis for an unknown cause, or let's say hypertriglyceridemia, um, which is kind of prone to recurrence, I, I don't think I would feel comfortable starting somebody on that. Um, that being said, it is a rare side effect of the medicine, um, you know, kind of a one in a thousand type thing. And I think thinking back, that's probably the, uh, the incidents that I've seen firsthand of patients who've been on the medicine, but um, most patients, if they've had pancreatitis, they don't want to have it again. And so when you mention it as a side effect, uh, they just kind of recoil and say, no, thank you. So I think it'd be, it'd be more difficult for the patient than the, the prescriber. Great. Well, thanks everybody for your attendance and fantastic questions today. And thank you very much, Dr. O'Donnell for this great talk. Um, just to say the slides are not yet posted, but they will be um, under events uh, and under events you choose webinars on the Cardio Ohio website. The information's in the chat um, and we will try to answer some of these questions as well. And with that, I will pass it off to Sherry to close us up.
Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell, for a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zach, for moderating. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Just a few quick wrap up things. If you joined late and you want CME, um, make sure you registered. If you haven't, um, you can register um, through the URL in the chat or through this QR code. Um, and we will make sure that you get the CME survey so that you can get credit. We will have a post evaluation survey that will come up as this ends, um, where we love your feedback. It's separate from the CME survey, but just so we can enhance our, the experience and also get future topics from you. And then our next webinar um, is in May 24th on Wednesday. We have a wonderful speaker, Dr. Milano from University of Cincinnati on sleep disorders and cardiovascular risk. And we will have registration soon for that. Thank you. Come to our website at cardio.org if you uh, want to learn more about us or see more of our resources. And we were delighted to have you all join us today. So thank you again for, for being here and have a good afternoon.